A driver speeds off after crashing into several cars on I-15. Tonight, the man who shot this video tells us what happened. A freak accident turns deadly in Provo Canyon. We'll explain what came crashing down off of the falls. Plus, a family of five is seriously burned after their van bursts into flames. How the community is now working to help them. And we're back into the 90s. Temperatures across northern Utah were heating up. Do we make it back into the triple digits? I'll let you know in the forecast. But first, we begin with breaking news. After a long search, the bodies of two men who've been missing since July 18th have been found. They were recovered today from Strawberry Reservoir, and that's where Fox 13's L. Thomas joins us live. L. Yeah, hey, Kirsten and Lauren. So the bodies of brothers Mike and Jim Gardner were covered around 5 o'clock this afternoon in the latter's area here at Strawberry Reservoir, finally giving this family some closure. The Wasatch County Sheriff's Office says they used sonar and rovers to find the two men, bringing an end to this 11-day search. It started on June 18th when a state employee who was driving past Strawberry saw a boat on the water without anyone on it. The Sheriff's Office says they believe there was some kind of accident on the water while they were fishing. They say the two were working to help each other when they died. We did hear from family today. They say fishing is a huge passion for all of them. That's what made them uh, want to get up in the morning and uh, kind of runs in the family. And uh, I knew that one wasn't going to leave the other either. That's just the way they were. So just the way we are. They had good hearts. And uh, they cared about others. Uh, they weren't, um, they just enjoyed, liked to enjoy life and their family. And uh, that's what meant the most to them. The official cause of death will be included in the medical examiner's report, but the sheriff's office says they have no reason to suspect foul play, and they do believe that the men drowned. Live at Strawberry Reservoir, L. Thomas, Fox 13 News, Utah. Thanks, Al. Now to a developing story in Utah County where a 23-year-old man from Mexico is dead after a log fell on him at Bridalville Falls this afternoon. The Utah County Sheriff's Office says what was most likely a log fell on the man at the base of the main waterfall. His family tried to revive him, but he died from his injuries. The Sheriff's Office believes it was just a freak accident and that nothing caused the log to fall. The vic victim's name has not been released. We aren't certain now whether it was uh, kicked loose by somebody else or just Mother Nature doing what Mother Nature does. We think it's most likely just uh, it just happened. Uh, nature does that sometimes. The sheriff's office says the man was planning to be here for two weeks for a family function. This video was shot on I-15 near Tippinogus Highway in Lehigh last Friday. And now troopers with the Utah Highway Patrol are trying to find the man behind the wheel of that red sports car so they can arrest him for hit and run. Today, Fox 13's Adam Herbet spoke to the man who took that video. As soon as the man behind the camera got rear-ended, he had a feeling it was not the driver behind him at fault. I, get me. Yeah, I know. No, you're good. You okay? Yeah, I'm fine. You all right? Okay. Yeah, I'm okay. 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 Like an He's drunk. I don't know. I couldn't tell you if he was or not. The victim, Dave, was on his way home from work. He says he saw the guy in the red sports car driving very poorly, so he tried to stay away. Hey, 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 hey. fishtailing he missed me by an inch let's take a look at that video one more time because if you slow it down pause and zoom in at just the right time you get a pretty decent look at the suspect's face but it gets even better than that it's a good thing our friends kept recording because as the car drives off look right there a perfect look at the license plate f48 6bf this is a red infinity g35 and that definitely gives police a good place to start. Not only did it put my life in danger for a split second, but other people as well. Dave says he was hurt, but he'll feel a lot better if the Utah Highway Patrol tracks this guy down. A stiff back and lots of headaches, that sucks, but uh, that's about it. Police say they are looking for the man and hope to have an update on the case by Monday. Reporting in Lehigh, Adam Herbetz, Fox 13 News, Utah.
A family of five is recovering after their van burst into flames in Saratoga Springs. Police say just before eight last night, the family was leaving Pelican Bay Marina at Utah Lake. Their older model Chevy box van caught fire, as you can see in this photo, and was almost immediately fully engulfed. A woman and four-year-old girl were flown to the hospital in serious condition. A man and two other children under the age of 10 went in an ambulance. They're all at the University of Utah burn unit. Fox 13 spoke with a woman who witnessed it all happen. Just basically really as a neighborhood, we're in distress knowing that somebody from our city was in real trouble, the whole family. And so um, we've been trying to come up with a way to help this family to be able to ensure that they're okay. That's why she and other members of the community and witnesses have started a fundraising page to help the family. We do have a link to that on our website, fox13now.com. This just into the Fox 13 newsroom. Some good news for drivers. Parts of Highway 89 in Utah County are back open after flash floods and mudslides swept down just tons of debris and damaged the road in Utah County Friday night. Highway 89 from Thistle Junction to mile marker 301 was supposed to be back open by tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock. But we have learned tonight that lanes are opening back up. UDOT says if you go by there, be prepared for some lane closures. But for now, it's back open. We've got a live look right now from my Interim Mountain camera this evening. Beautiful evening shaping up. In fact, I wonder if it's the kind that turns the Wasatch Mountains pink, as it does mm. sometimes on a, on a nice little evening. Very hot day, though, in Breck. Only going to get hotter from here. Yeah, temperatures returning back into the 90s. Mm -hmm. We enjoyed the 80s at least for a couple of days. Of course, we had to bring the clouds, rain showers, boy, that uh, flooding towards Spanish Fork. We don't want to see that, but we don't want to get uh, temperatures too warm. And again, as you can see across northern Utah today, we got up to 95 in Salt Lake City, 92 in Provo. Several spots in the 90s where yesterday we were in the 80s, even some 70s. Look at St. George, your official high today. 106. Now, as we take a look at temperatures along the Wasatch Front, it is a beautiful sunset, but temperatures still quite warmer, almost 90 degrees still in Salt Lake City, a little cooler as we look towards uh, Utah County. Uh, right now in Spanish Fork, you're still hanging on to the 90s. 60s, though, in Park City. We've got 70s from Vernal to Price, currently 90 degrees in Green River. Still triple digits in St. George. Uh, we have high pressure in place. That's bringing the hot temperatures and the position of the high pressure to the south, allowing for moisture to track through Nevada, not the state of Utah. Now, a little bit of moisture has been moving across extreme northern Utah with just a few clouds. Earlier on, we had some brief showers, but all in all, it's going to be a nice night. Uh, a little bit warmer, though, as we look for the overnight low in Salt Lake City, getting down to 72 degrees. Partly cloudy skies. We're going to keep it mild. Yeah, starting off, looks like it's going to be warm with the week, but we're going to bring back that monsoon moisture. How good of a chance will we see some rain? We're going to let you know coming up in just a few minutes. Thanks, Breck. New at 9, Heber City Police say they've made a big drug bust. Police arrested these two women last night, Lanessa Gardner and Mariposa Santio. They were initially pulled over for a traffic stop, but officers found heroin, meth, pot, LSD, Oxycontin, and Xanax inside. Police say there was also a 13-year-old girl in the car, too. She's been referred to juvenile court on drug charges. Both Gardner and Santio are in jail tonight in Wasatch County. A shelter in place for a Murray neighborhood is over tonight after a SWAT standoff. Police say it started as a domestic dispute. The wife and children were able to get out of the home safely. Police spent time trying to make contact with the man. Officers entered the home and found the man dead of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Authorities are looking into what caused a mobile home to go up in flames near the Utah-Arizona border. According to the St. George News, the man and woman that were inside this motorhome noticed the vehicle smoking yesterday afternoon and were able to safely get out. Witnesses say smoke could be seen for miles, and it took about two hours to put out that fire. Also in St. George, a couple is accused of dragging a 15-year-old girl with their car all while trying to steal her cell phone. Police said Anthony and Braley Alamillo agreed to buy a phone from the teen using the Let Go app. When the girl approached their car to show them the phone, police said they sped off with the girl halfway inside their car. Both suspects were booked into jail under suspicion of robbery and aggravated assault. Five teens from Utah were hurt in Anaheim, California Friday following a drunk driving crash. 
Police say a man driving drunk in a truck ran a red light and hit the teen's car, causing them to hit a utility pole. Family members identified one of the teens as 18-year-old Christina Goana of St. George. They say she was taken to the hospital with life-threatening injuries, but she had surgery and is now expected to survive. A group of national organizations came together today to plan a march in support of victims of child sexual abuse by religious leaders. The group say they are working to create safe spaces and accountability in all places of worship. One of the participating groups, Protect Every Child, is run by former Latter-day Saint Bishop Sam Young. He opposes one-on-one -on -one sexually explicit interviews within the church. When you read a newspaper article or you see an article on Channel 13 that talks about another priest has been arrested and he's abused 25 kids, we don't want to be reading those anymore. Other participating organizations include the Survivors Network of Those Abused by Priests, the Zero Abuse Project, and Talk to a Survivor. Well, coming up, local law enforcement will soon get ready to pay their respects to a four-legged officer. And a medical marvel is in the works here in Utah. We'll tell you about when this bionic arm may be available for everyone. Live from Fox 13 Studios, this is Fox 13 News at 9. Welcome back. Firefighters are choosing to let a blaze burn after lightning ignited a single ponderosa pine near Fish Lake National Forest. Fire officials said the lightning strike happened on Wednesday. Instead of putting the fire out, crews are letting it burn to help create a healthy ecosystem. Currently, the fire is only burning one-tenth of an acre, and it is not uh, threatening any structures. Tomorrow, the Utah County Sheriff's Office will say their final goodbyes to one of their own, a canine officer who died after being hit by a car. Sergeant Spencer Cannon says a service will be held for Havoc tomorrow in Spanish Fork. Havoc ran into the road in Vineyard earlier this month when a driver hit him. He was taken to the vet where he later died. Havoc had been working with the department since 2013 and was seven years old. Well, a small dog barked up a storm when he found an intruder in the home. Somehow this ball python made its way into an apartment last night. Of course, giving the renter quite the scare. The snake posed perfectly, though, for the photo that Bountiful Police posted, saying if this exotic pet is yours, to give Davis County Animal Control a call. Well, this is straight from a sci-fi movie. University of Utah engineers are helping develop a bionic arm that moves with just the user's thoughts. In fact, a West Valley City man is one of a few people testing out the Luke arm. The device is named after Luke Skywalker from Star Wars, and it gives amputees a sense of touch back. Now, researchers say it even allows people to do delicate tasks that would be impossible with the standard prosthetic arm the corrugated wall and I was able to feel the bumps on the corrugation and that was the first time in 13 years that I'd ever done that and that was just it, it about made me cry it was it was exciting the engineers behind the Luke arm say they're looking to bring it to the take-home trial stage within the next two years well, Breck, it is hard to believe, but we only have a couple days left in July, and August is here. But it was I a, cannot believe that. I know, but it was a pretty hot July. We hit triple digits more than normal, right? Yeah, well, usually in the month of July, we get three days. I think we got up to six days wow. in the month of July. Now, the record's 15, so it's not the hottest July on record <laughs> for sure. But, uh, yeah, we got up to above normal temperatures across northern Utah, where the previous two days... We enjoyed some 80s, but we also had to bring the rain and the clouds. That wasn't the case today. I wanted to share a photo coming in from a viewer. This is Scott Taylor up in Manaway. If you know where Manaway is at, that's in Sardine Canyon in between Brigham City, heading over towards Logan. Beautiful shot there. Uh, you know, we had a few high clouds over the mountains, but really no threat of any rain across the state. It was dry for sure. Official high in Salt Lake City, 95. On average, we should be close to that, 94. Look at the record of 106. Yeah, last week we had three days in triple digits. We know we can see those hot temperatures even as we look towards the first week of August. Triple digits, though, in the Dixie area. Right now, still 100 degrees, winds calm. Look at the humidity. It's low. 
not only across southern Utah, but across the north as well. The humidity at 22 percent, where yesterday morning we were looking at humidity levels between 50 and 60 percent. Of course, we had the rain in the morning. Temperature 88 degrees, mostly clear skies. We're expecting to find for most of the Wasatch Front to find mostly clear conditions, at least in the overnight hours. Now, looking ahead, we've been talking about these warmer temperatures that are on tap and long range as we move into the first week of August, Climate Prediction Center showing that looks like for the state of Utah, we're going to see above normal temperatures. Nothing of great significance, but we're definitely going to keep it warm. And that's going to be the situation as we look towards tomorrow. Also, you know, through the whole winter, getting into the month of June, drought situation just was not a concern. But as we've kept it kind of fairly dry here over the past two or three weeks, you'll notice now the colors dry for the Wasatch Mountains, Wasatch Mountain Valleys through central Utah, where again, just a week ago, we had no contours showing any concerns, but you know, we could definitely use some moisture. We're going to get a little bit. Of course, last week we saw that monsoon flow bringing the clouds and the rain Thursday, Friday into a Saturday morning. Right now, that position of the high pressure, not ideal to see that monsoon moisture tracking through the state of Utah. We're seeing it over towards Nevada, could threaten areas such as Wendover, but high pressure again to the south. We need it closer towards the Four Corners area. It will make its move over there probably late Tuesday through Wednesday, but under this flow, at least a portion of this moisture will clip extreme northern Utah even tonight. Let's take a look at our computer models clock here for this evening. Let's roll through tomorrow morning, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock. Some clouds along the Wasatch Front. A potential for some light rain showers through Box Elder County, Cache County, maybe as far south as Brigham City, maybe north Ogden, but it's mainly confined to extreme northern Utah, but it's pumping in some moisture. So as we head into the afternoon with the heating of the day, there will be chances of some isolated showers, Box Elder County, mainly over the mountains of northern Utah. So we're talking the Wasatch Mountains. I think most of the Wasatch front staying dry as far as the valleys are concerned. Then it tracks over towards southwest Wyoming. So a little bit of cloud cover, slight chance of rain, extreme northern Utah, rest of the state staying dry Monday and also into Tuesday. 60s and 70s for overnight lows. I will throw in a thread of a shower for eastern Nevada, Wendover, Box Elder County overnight. And then tomorrow morning, again, extreme northern Utah, some light rain showers, mountain showers across northern Utah. But tomorrow's temperatures Hot, even warmer than what we found today. 97 expected high in Salt Lake City, 95 in Provo. Upper 80s to low 90s from Vernal to Price. Expecting triple digits in Moab. 107 in St. George. That'll be the hottest day of the week. A little bit cooler Tuesday with some cloud cover for St. George. And then a chance of rain as that monsoon moisture moving through. Dropping temperatures, afternoon shower, lingering on into Thursday. We'll hold on to the 90s, then we'll push that moisture away. Heading into the weekend, we're back into the triple digits. Northern Utah, upper 90s, but we also see the cloud cover and some rain showers Wednesday, potentially into Thursday. Looking at maybe upper 80s on Thursday, but also, again, moisture moving away heading into the weekend. It gets dry, it gets hot, it returns. So that's the first week of August. We're still hanging on to those dog days of summer. And it looks like we're going along with it. And that drought map was super interesting because I'm sure if we showed last year's oh, in yeah, comparison. Last, it, so it's still very, good. It's still, yeah. right. it's just, you know, we didn't have any of those colors on this map mm -hmm. for the last three months. Well, I should say two and a half months. So now just we Which we almost it. got to August though. All right, that's okay. true. So hopefully you get a little rain this week. Great. Thanks, Breck. Mm -hmm. Still ahead, we'll tell you the special story of two Utah artists in this week's edition of Uniquely Utah. Joining us, well, when you think of famous artists, a few probably come to mind, like Michelangelo and Van Gogh. And aside from being great artists, you probably know that they have another thing in common. Most of the masters were men. As Fox 13's Todd Tanner shows us, he has a unique tale of how gender affected Utah artists more than a century ago. Inside the Utah Museum of Fine Arts, two paintings from 1892. One by a man named J.T. Harwood. The other by his wife, Harriet Richards Harwood. It was really quite difficult to uh, establish yourself as an artist if you were a woman. Both artists were from Utah. Both traveled to Paris to perfect their craft, but going forward, one's career had more opportunities than the other. 
It was very difficult to get in. Only JT was accepted into Paris's most prestigious school. They called it Beaux-Arts. It was only available for men to enter until 1897. It was there J.T. Harwood perfected painting the human form. One of the reasons women weren't allowed, the idea that it was inappropriate for them to gaze upon nude models. One thing that um, you find very often in works by women artists is that they specialize in genres or subject matter that didn't require studies of, of figures from life. Not only was it restricted in terms of um, education, but also exhibition opportunities were really limited. J.T. Harwood's piece, Preparation for Dinner, was exhibited in the esteemed Paris Salon in 1892. It was the first work by a Utah artist accepted to the salon and really a feather in that artist's cap. Um, but Harriet Harwood was not able to, to submit her work at that time. In 1893, the biggest event in the world was in the USA, the Chicago World's Fair. And it included both artists' work. Well, sort of. J.T. Harwood's work was shown in the Fine Arts Building, whereas there was another building or pavilion established for the display of works by women artists, and that's where Harriet's work was displayed. More than a century later, J.T. and Harriet are finally side by side. I think that uh, there are many women artists who have yet to be um, researched thoroughly and brought to the public eye, and I think that Harriet Richards Harwood is one of those artists. Todd Tanner, Fox 13 News, Utah. Beautiful work and an interesting history. Still to come, a five-year-old saves more than a dozen people from a fire. We're going to hear from the hero. And after Robert Mueller's testimony earlier this week, where do Democrats on Capitol Hill stand if the president should stay in office? Democrats are still pushing the possibility of impeaching President Trump, despite the fact that House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has shown no interest in doing so. Fox News' Garrett Tenney shows us why she's concerned it could backfire. After Robert Mueller's testimony this week, House Democrats are as divided as ever on impeaching President Trump. Roughly a hundred House lawmakers now support impeachment, but at least a hundred more are needed to formally start that process. However, House Judiciary Committee Chairman Jerry Nadler says that in effect, his committee has been conducting an impeachment investigation for months. And after Mueller's testimony, he said there is still more evidence they want to look at. What Mueller showed, uh... Uh, the vi possible violations of the emoluments clause, all the things that uh, might cause us to recommend articles of impeachment. There are articles of impeachment that have been recommended to the committee, and uh, we are investigating and uh, determining whether we should report those articles to the House. As the next step in their investigation, Democrats on the Judiciary Committee are now trying to get their hands on the grand jury information in the Mueller report, telling a federal judge on Friday the evidence is essential for them to fully investigate the president and his administration. Most Republican lawmakers disagree, including Congressman John Ratcliffe, who argues this is just the latest act of desperation from Democrats trying to keep their impeachment dream alive. So now they're moving on saying they want to pursue obstruction by uh, the court system and trying to get grand jury information. Look, it's, 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 it's becoming a joke. I think people see that and Nadler and Schiff are starting to look more like Laurel and Hardy. It's time to move on. This next week, the Judiciary Committee plans to enforce subpoenas for former White House counsel Don McGahn to testify before the committee. In addition, the committee plans to file a lawsuit challenging the administration's claim that former White House employees have absolute immunity from testifying before Congress. In Washington, I'm Garrett Tenney, Fox News. In Brooklyn, New York, police are looking for whoever shot a dozen people at a block party killing one of them. Police say the shooting happened last night at a park in the Brownsville neighborhood. Officers say the 12 victims were taken to two nearby hospitals. That's where a 38-year-old man died. Mayor Bill de Blasio says shooting, the shooting scattered a peaceful event. Moment, but I want to make really clear, this tragedy does not define Brownsville, does not define the people of Brownsville, it does not define what's happening on the ground in a community that has worked so hard 
and come so far. Police say there were more than 100 officers and upwards of 2,000 people at the event when the shots rang out. Authorities in Oregon say a toddler missing after his parents were found dead in an apparent murder-suicide has been found dead in Montana. Police say the remains believed to be those of two-year-old Aiden Sal uh, Salcedo were found in a remote area. It was near where his parents were found dead earlier this week. Witness tips led police there. An autopsy will determine the cause of death. And check this out. A five-year-old boy in Chicago is being called a hero after saving 13 people from a duplex fire. Jaden Espinoza was staying with his aunt, and he was the only one awake when he smelled smoke. He ran back inside and told everybody to get out, including the downstairs neighbors. But how did you know to go tell her? Because I'm a smart and I'm a brilliant. He saved everyone. If he hadn't got sent to his auntie's house Wednesday, then he would have never been there to get everybody out of the building. And he was very smart. Investigators are still trying to figure out what caused that fire. Well, coming up, we're going to show you how a Utah program is helping people across the country enjoy the great outdoors. And with weather the way it's going, it was, looks like we'll have plenty of opportunity to enjoy the great outdoors. It was hot today. Give you a view from our Ochre Mountain camera looking across the Tooele Valley earlier on. Time lapse throughout the afternoon. We had these fair weather cumulus clouds rolling through. No rain. Warm temperatures, though. We're keeping it dry for now. Also heating things up. But there is a chance of rain over the next seven days. We'll share that 70 forecast after the break. Welcome back. Governors from across the country came to Utah this week, all part of the National Governors Association. Yeah, and it was here where they launched a new outdoor recreation learning network. Fox 13's Max Ross shows us. It's probably as appropriate as we talk about outdoor recreation that uh, you're here in Utah. Utah, home to 38 million acres of public land, became the backdrop for the launch of a new outdoor recreation learning network. The new program is modeled after one Governor Gary Herbert created in 2013. We were the first state in America to have an outdoor recreation office. Uh, to promote outdoor recreation in all of its forms. Six years later, more than a dozen states have taken similar action to promote outdoor recreation. They hope to help other states replicate Utah's success while tailoring it to their state's needs. It's a chance for outdoor recreation directors from across the country to get together, um, to form peer-to-peer um, -peer connections and learn from each other about how they can advance um, outdoor recreation in their state. Sue Gander with the National Governors Association says that not only is outdoor recreation an obvious health benefit, it's also a boost to the economy. You've got 2.2 percent of GDP associated with the outdoor industry and 4.3 million jobs um, across the country. Because of the good work in that area, our tourism and travel has increased double digits the last seven years in a row. The NGA says the goal is to get more states engaged in promoting outdoor recreation. You can have the tourism folks and the natural resource folks and the economic development folks and others that work on this topic all come together and really just create more interest in outdoor activities. We have a beautiful country and an opportunity for our young people to rediscover some of the beauties of nature with, with this new proposal. Max Roth, Fox 13 News, Utah. Later in sports, Utah State QB Jordan Love tells us what it's like to have a world-class kicker at their disposal. Plus the highlights from Sunday, including the Bees trying to snare a rare sweep over the weekend. Back in a bit. All right, so we're just talking about the Bees, yeah. and it sounds like they had a chance for a sweep tonight. Yeah, you know, it's been a while. They haven't swept since May couple months. They want another one. They want another one, Lauren. This time at Albuquerque, Salt Lake coming in. Winners of four or five this week against the Isotopes. Taylor Ward challenging Jonathan Daza up that unique hill in center and may just have robbed a Salt Lake home run in the first, but in the third, the Bees try again, and this time Jose Rojas gets the best of Daza. The double scores Nick Franklin for the lead, Albuquerque brings home their first runs in the seventh. Brian Mundell through the 3-4 hole to even the game up at three. But the Bees buzz big in the eighth. How about that alliteration? Five runs across in the frame, including a two-run jumbo jack off the lumber of Nick Franklin. And the brooms finally come out 10-4 the final. 
Gander RV 400. That's Kyle Bush's little boy, Brexton, hoping to see his pop sweep Pocono. And a good start, Bush taking the checkered flag at stage one. But he did have a couple of key pit stops later on, including in the upper right corner there, the Skittles car without enough gas to finish, allowing Denny Hamlin to sweep across first. And that meant a celebratory donut spin and smoke bomb as well. Roy McElroy was a hair ahead of Brooks Kepka after three rounds at the FedEx St. Jude invite. Bill Belichick and Elvis on hand to watch Tony Finau. What a combination that was. Back-to-back -back 68s for the West High product. You're watching one of his six birdies. Finau wrapped up at minus three in a tie for 27th. As for Kepka, he clearly outdueled McElroy and everybody else for that matter on the final day, posting a 64, then a 65 over the weekend to win with a score of 16 under par, three strokes better than Webb Simpson. The three-week marathon that is the Tour de France wrapped up this morning. Not a whole lot of excitement for stage 21. The Colombian cyclist Egon Bernal had it virtually all wrapped up before the day began, so treating this like a casual Sunday stroll through the park. Australian Caleb Ewan took the stage, but for the first time ever, a South American has won it at 22. Bernal is also the third youngest winner in the race's history. To the rodeo, where Stetson Wright hauled in a nice payday Sunday after winning one of the biggest roundups in the country. The Milford native had a 93-point bull ride at Cheyenne's Frontier Days to win not only on the bull today, but the all-around as well. Congrats to him. The Aggies will officially begin fall camp on Thursday. Utah State returns several playmakers, including returning quarterback Jordan Love, who had uh, some people are watching as a possible Heisman candidate. But on the special team side, they have a couple of gems as well in return specialist Savon Scarver and place kicker Dominique Eberly. Eberly, one of the most decorated kickers in college football right now. He was a finalist for the Lou Groza Award in 2017 and a semi-finalist last year. He's also set a Utah State record for points scored in a single season after converting on 75 extra points and 22 field goals and even became the first USU kicker to successfully boot six field goals through in a single game. That's huge, just knowing that, I mean, if we're not going to score a touchdown on the drive, at least get us in the field goal position because, I mean, I know he's going to make the kick. 10 times out of 10. So um, just having to kick it like that, I mean, it just, it kind of takes like some relief off the offense knowing that I mean, you don't have to, I mean, you'd like to score every time, but if you don't score, just get in the field goal position, he's going to get three points. Yeah, next on the Fox 13 sports page, plenty more on Utah State, not to mention the Utes and Cougars as well as everybody gets ready to begin fall camp later this week. Plus the last of the Jazz's new free agents explain why they settled on Utah and the latest on Mike Petke's suspension as well. Yeah, you gave us a look at that confrontation yesterday with Petke. Yeah, it's just another day for Mike Petke. It's <laughs> just uh, another Saturday enough. or Wednesday or whatever it was. Yeah, he <laughs> likes to, to get in the grill of those officials now and again. Interesting. It'll be good to hear the latest. Thanks, yeah. Morgan. Thanks. Let's give another look at your weather forecast. First, I want to share another photo coming in from a viewer. This is Peter Finn who's been hiking up Little Cottonwood Canyon. He says, boy, the water there coming down the creek, still running high, running fast. Still quite a bit of snow, he says, as you get to some of the higher elevations up on the peaks, Mount Bal uh, Baldy, Hidden Peak as well. So it's kind of strange that this late of the season, we're still finding that creek running this fast and high. But of course, we had close to season records there with the snowpack up in the higher terrain. And of course, we've been warming things up. It was hot last weekend up until we reached the, uh, I should say last week, until we reached the weekend where afternoon highs Yesterday and the day before, getting up into the 80s. Today, we're in the mid-90s, still holding on to the upper 80s in Salt Lake City, currently 84 degrees in Ogden, cooling off to 80 degrees right now in Provo. Uh, temperatures dropping down in the 60s and low 70s along the Wasatch Front. Looking ahead, as we've been seeing more of a warming and drying trend, that will be in place for the first half of the week. Temperatures get hot. Hot today, even warmer tomorrow. And then looking towards a little bit of that monsoon moisture making its way back into the area, giving us a chance of some rain. Now, right now, we're keeping that moisture away. It's really tracking through Nevada, but it will clip extreme northern Utah overnight. That changes some things in the forecast just a little bit, where, again, with this high pressure in place to the south, we're going to see a little bit of increased moisture, which begins to push its way through portions of the Wasatch Front come tomorrow. But as this high pressure swings a little bit further eastward, 
wrapping around near the Four Corners area. We kind of make that move of the monsoon flow, pushing it over across the state. And we'll see at least as we head into Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday into Thursday, a little bit more cloud cover and a chance of rain. Let's confirm that. Now looking at our long range forecast models, getting you through the whole week as we push through tonight. Again, extreme northern Utah, Tomorrow morning, potentially could see some brief light rain showers, mountain showers throughout the afternoon across northern Utah. Then it's dry heading into Tuesday. We start to see some clouds tracking through southern Utah on Tuesday. Wednesday, though, the moisture really spreads out. Better chance of seeing some afternoon showers both across the north and the south, even pushing into eastern Utah. Now, it's only a 20 to a 30 percent possibility for the valleys. Mountains a better chance, but that will bring in some clouds, cooling off temperatures and lingering moisture expected as we head into Thursday, bringing some showers across northern Utah until Friday when we finally clear things out. So as we look at your hour by hour forecast, getting you ready for tomorrow, it's mostly clear, but we will have some clouds around for tomorrow. Temperatures starting off in the 70s will already be in the 80s heading into the 9 o'clock hour, where afternoon highs getting up in the mid to upper 90s along the Wasatch Front. You notice I have some rain showers a little bit, some lightning there, where again, Box Elder County, uh, northern end of the Wasatch Front, Cache County, Ridge County could see some showers both in the morning and maybe an isolated shower or thunderstorm throughout the afternoon. Rest of the state, you're holding on to the sunshine. It's dry and warmer. Mid 90s expected in Provo, near 90 degrees in Price, 90 in Cedar City, 107 in St. George. Again, in that mo uh, moisture pushing through on Wednesday, bringing the clouds and a chance of rain showers, 90s. That's kind of cool there for the Dixie area, or at least comparing to where you've been here for the past several days and for northern Utah. Upper 90s through Tuesday, mostly cloudy skies Wednesday with a chance of some afternoon showers Wednesday, Thursday. That'll drop temperatures in the 80s, but we push away that moisture heading into the weekend as temperatures return back in the mid 90s for Saturday and Sunday. She graduated from BYU with degrees in Russian literature and international studies, got her master's degree from Harvard and her doctorate from MIT. She speaks six languages and is a wife and mother of three who recently left a very important and lucrative job at Microsoft to become the first female president of Utah Valley University. There is an awful lot to Astrid Tuminez. I sat down with her and asked her three questions. Tell me, how do you balance your academic, your professional, and your family life? Yes. How does that work? <laughs> I get asked that question a lot, and I usually start out by saying that there is no balance. What I mean by that is um, any endeavor of excellence, whether you want to be a top concert pianist, or you want to be an Olympic athlete, or you want to be a great mom, everything requires such tremendous commitment and energy and time and planning. And so there is no balance. If by balance you mean that I live a life where all the schedules work and I get eight hours of sleep, you know, there are all these trade-offs. So I don't sleep very much and I have a great partner. I don't think that I would have I could have done everything that I've managed to do without my husband. And that partnership began even before we got married, mm. where, you know, we had this understanding that his dreams mattered and my dreams mattered, and we were going to support one another. So that dialogue, that honest dialogue took place early in our relationship. And then I kind of get used to chaos and insanity, <laughs> but um, I also really subscribe to self-care. You are a product of the slums of the Philippines, and there are are to this day still millions of other people who are in the slums of developing nations around the world. And yet here you are, the president of a very large university with a master's and PhD and having worked as an executive at Microsoft in charge of major projects around the world here in the United States and Asia and Mos how do you account for your rise to where you are now? 
So what really uh, saved me and my family was that when I was five years old, nuns from the Daughters of Charity, a Catholic order, found my family and offered us the chance to go to their school for free. So without exaggerating, education changed the trajectory of my life. So that's one thing to say about the slums. The second thing to say about the slums is that that is where I learned to let my imagination run free. So I lived in a hut on stilts in the water. My father had seven children. Um, my mother left when I was five. And my father earned the equivalent of about 50 US dollars a month. So in that setting where you don't have a lot of external stimulation in terms of books or radio or television, we had none of that. You really had to imagine a lot of things. And, and I think that was a really, really good thing because I imagined my possibilities really wildly. And, and, and that's really good. And the third thing that, that came from the slums is the, is the grittiness and the can-do attitude that has really served me well in my entire life. You most recently left a very lucrative and high-profile job at Microsoft. Why did you take this job as president of UVU? Yes, um, so when I first learned about the job at UVU, I actually didn't immediately think that it was the right match for me. But as I learned about UVU, I became very intrigued with its model of higher education. It's a model that says to people, come as you are, it's open admission. And then it's also a model that says, we don't privilege one type of higher education versus another. UVU has a dual mission, which means a university and a community college. So whether you're talking about vocational, career and technical education, or degrees in philosophy or social sciences, or literature, or cybersecurity, it's all there in one place. And I love that. And it seemed to meld very well with things I had learned at Microsoft, that the world was being turned upside down by technology. And the question that always puzzled me is how do we expand the capitalization of human potential? How do you actually release human potential? And I'd been at Microsoft six years. I loved it there very much. It was a very difficult decision. But I also wanted to scale, you know, the ability to, to influence even more lives and maybe really apply some things that I thought were important for higher education in one place. And then the other insight that I had, because I've had a very varied career, I've worked in philanthropy, I've worked on Wall Street, I've worked on the peace process, process in the southern Philippines, I led a project in Russia, I was asking myself, what is the one place where the things that I know how to do and the lessons that I've learned could be put to good use? And a university was the perfect answer, and I have family in Utah, and it just seemed like the perfect next step. So I have no regrets, it's been eight months, um, I've loved it here in Utah, and I love UVU. Well, Dr. Astrid Tuminez, seventh president of Utah Valley University, thank you so much for being part of Three Questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is Fox 13 News. Finally on Fox 13, take a look at this. It is what you think it is. The annual World Thumb Wrestling Championships took place this weekend in England. The unusual sport, sport, is played using a wooden board around the thumbs which resembles a small wrestling ring. Participants compete in three one minute long matches against each opponent with women and men competing separately. Okay. I guess men's thumbs are stronger. <laughs> each match begins with the customary chant, one, two, three, four, I declare a thumb war, and ends when an opponent is pinned for as long as it takes for the winner to say, one, two, three, four, I win the thumb oh, war. Oh, I did not know that was the official. Two, one, two, three, four, four I let's I have one thumb more. more. Go. We're here to oh, oh, I win the thumb war. Okay. You See, that's why they have best. men and women separate. Well, best out of three. We'll keep it going. <laughs> okay, so hot tomorrow, cool down middle of the week. Uh, yeah, some uh, showers hopefully by Wednesday. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Brett. Uh -huh. And don't go anywhere. Quick cast is up next.